And good morning. Uh, you've reached Profiles and Perspectives with Darswell Rogers. We are kicking off here a little bit later. We've worked through some technical challenges that we had, but I promise you that uh, the conversation and the discussion that we're going to have today makes it all the worth it. I am so pleased to have with me, and this is all being done remote, uh, Miss Lisa Jones. She is um, a member of the uh, Juneteenth Speakers Bureau of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. We're going to learn a whole lot more about her because she's going to be speaking here in our community, but I'm, I'm not going to let me finish my introductions. Uh, first off, Lisa, welcome. Good morning. And we also have Mr. Mark Barnes. He's the public relations spokesperson for the North Carolina History Center and a former Reporter for the Fayetteville Observer, Mark, welcome. Good to appreciate your having me on. So, um, I'm as we all know, Juneteenth is coming up, and the North Carolina Center uh, for Civil War and Emancipation and Reconstruction has, has scheduled an event for Monday, June 17th. It's going to be at 7 p.m. at Mount Sinai uh, Missionary Baptist Church, 1217 Burchison Road. Which is you know right across from state from Fayette, right across the street from Fayetteville State University, and uh, Miss Jones is going to be our speaker for that event. Um, before I jump totally into what you're going to cover that day, Miss Jones, uh, Mark, let me give you a, a minute or two because the North Carolina. Uh, Center on the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction is a project that we've been working on for some time. Can you give our listeners the basic background on what the center is, where it's <clears throat> going to be, cover the kind of the basics? Okay. I'm glad to do it. The uh, Civil War, um, the North Carolina History Center on the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction is being built in Arsenal Park, which is... Um, off of um, Brian and Branson in that area in Haymount uh, in Fayetteville. Uh, Arsenal Park uh, commemorates the, uh, ar the arsenal that was there actually dating from the 1830s. This was a place where they made rifles and pistols and cannon and so forth. In the beginning of the Civil War, the arsenal was taken over by the Confederate States of America and became a Confederate arsenal. In March of 1865, it was destroyed by General William Sherman, who also destroyed the then Confederate-leaning Fayetteville Observer newspaper at the same time. So he was taking away the enemy's ability to make war, to make cannon and, and shot and so forth. And he was also taking away the, um, the voice of folks who were urging uh, the Confederacy to move forward. He took away the newspaper. He destroyed both. Uh, much, much later in history, that became a uh, historic uh, site and museum of the Cape Fear. Uh, it's located there at this time. In 2007, a number of citizens came together to find out if more could be done with the history of the area, knowing how popular the Special Operations and Airborne uh, Museum is in downtown Fayetteville. In 2007, the General Assembly appropriated a million dollars uh, grant to figure out how to better interpret Arsenal Park. The study concluded that a new kind of museum was very feasible funds were raised for it and so forth, and we're now in the midst of some beginning stages of construction. If you drive by the site right now, what you're going to see is construction that has begun on a pavilion <clears throat> and outdoor classroom, which will be intended for use by school children in the future. Uh, basically, there's going to be a canopy there, there are going to be some restrooms there and so forth for children who are arriving on buses to the center when the center opens. Later this year, they're hoping to begin the construction on the main building. Inside the center, uh, there's going to be basically the story of North Carolina before, during, and after the Civil War. 
all of that is based on university level research and curators with, you know, museum curators uh, that are associated with the Smithsonian Institute and so forth. One of our advisors, uh, Dr. Spencer Crew, is the curator, was the first curator of the uh, Museum of African American Museum in, in Washington, Smithsonian, there on the National Mall. Um, and so it's, it's all going to be based on fact. It's not going to be based on the stories of the lost cause and so forth that we have come to hear about the Civil War. It's going to feature things about um, how North Carolina was affected by the war. We have uh, a number of stories we are collecting, uh, stories from across the state of individual family um, experiences in the Civil War, and that will all be part of our database. The Civil War Center is going to be unusual in that it's not an artifact-based museum, as most museums are. It is a story-based museum. We will be telling the stories of what actually happened in the Civil War. In the West was mostly Union. In the center of the state, there was mostly Quakers. And in the East, there was mostly slaves. And that's the story that we're going to tell. One of the unusual aspects of this is it's the only one of its kind, is that it's going to be online as well as in a building. And what the center is going to be doing is, will be to help meet state educational requirements that each child be taught Civil War history in the 4th, 8th, and 11th grades. It will tell the stories of how the Civil War affected families across the state. And as I said before, it will deliver everything, lectures, uh, videos, presentations, uh, our Harry Jones lecture that uh, we will be hearing on the 17th will be recorded. That'll be part of our collection. And that will all be available to every school child from Manteo to Murphy in North Carolina and beyond anywhere in the world where you can get an internet connection. Wow. So this is this is what this is basically what we are we are about, um, and we are excited to move forward with the construction and see that we're open uh, in mid 2027, and we're doing this um, all of this uh, to make to move toward a more perfect union. Awesome. Uh, Mark, I thought you did that uh, beautifully. Let me, before I, I bring in Ms. Jones, because we really want to dive into what you are going to share. Uh, uh, the North Carolina History Center was initially called the North Carolina History kind of Civil War, and then it went from Civil War and has moved to emancipation and, and then Reconstruction. And so I want to give the, the community a tremendous amount of credit for having helped to expand and provide greater contextual framework for what right. what at least what the name is not to say that that wouldn't have always been the intent it's hard to say but i'm, I'm excited for for what how it has evolved and and what it's going to become uh, yeah it, it it's always been it's always been the intent to include everything because from the very first planning documents we talked about the time before the time during and the time after the civil war in north carolina that would be the, the Civil War itself, that would be the Emancipation, and that would be Reconstruction. One of the big things that we're going to have, and this has been mentioned publicly before, one of the big things we're going to have is going to be a big sound and light presentation of the coup in Wilmington. Mm. And that's not something that anybody has seen or discussed or even talked about in North Carolina history, but that's going to be... Uh, a main main part of the um, of the experience of people who visit the center. And this I, I, is one of the things that I like to mention to you is that this is being designed by Eisterhold and Associates in Kansas City, Missouri, and they have designed high level uh, museums across the country to include the Laramie Hotel Motel in in Memphis, Tennessee, to include the Harriet Tubman, uh, to include right here where I am sitting today, uh, the sit-in museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
mm-hmm. uh, which commemorates the AT, A&T 4. Uh, that began the sit-in movement, which revitalized the civil rights movement in the United States. So it's going to be world class, and it's going to be for everyone. Everyone is going to be able to um, to get some very useful content out of the uh, out of the center. And it just, you know, it's it's a reminder to me of what Maya Angelou said, which was basically, do the best you can, and when you know better, do better. Mm. And that's what that's what this center is going to be about. When we 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 will know better, and we can do better. Awesome. So, so Miss Jones, uh, I want to just finish out your uh, you, you, a little bit more of your background. You're, you're also, aside from being um, um, a um, a, a speaker, a Juneteenth Bureau speaker, you're also the co-founder and executive director of the Washington Waterfront Underground Railroad Museum in Washington, North Carolina, and a well-known local historian in Eastern North Carolina. And you're gonna be giving the Harry Jones Memorial Lecture. So with that, without any further delay, <clears throat> uh, once again, welcome and and share with us a little bit about what the what the uh, program is going to be about uh, on uh, on June seventeenth and and more about actually the the um, Underground Railroad Museum, which I did not know existed until I spoke to you the other day. The, the program will highlight a lot of the history that we illustrate and represent at the Washington Waterfront Underground Railroad. Um, I like what Mark said about the History Center being able to include everybody's history, because for a long time, um, so much of our history, especially here in Eastern Carolina, as I'm sure it is everywhere, has not been well represented. And so what the museum does, it exists to explain how freedom seekers were able to self-emancipate from the 147 plantations that were in the greater Washington area. We talk about how they were able to do that using their creativity, along with the help of abolitionists who were in the area, who were black, white, Native American, Latino, Hispanic. I mean, people from all walks of life who lived in Washington, the Beaufort County area at that time, who believed it was not right that people should be enslaved. They worked together in this small Confederate community in North Carolina to help freedom seekers gain their freedom. So we walked through how that even took place, how they got information about how to escape, when to escape, who would help them. We illustrate the work of uh, Black river pilots, sometimes called Black Jacks or Black uh, Mariners, who shared information with abolitionists in this area about what ships were coming into the port of Washington, what day, what they were here for, um, how long they would be here. Uh, They could give them important information like, did a ship captain smoke his ship? Smoking the ship was taking barrel out, setting it on fire, extinguishing the fire, and then sticking it in nooks and crannies um, in the ship where a person could possibly hide to see if they could hear someone coughing because the smoke in, in invoked a coughing response. So it could take up to about 15 people each doing their own thing to help an enslaved person to be able to escape from the Port of Washington. The Maritime over Underground Railroad was the number one way people escaped from the greater Washington area. We had overland routes as well. We had many free black communities here. Um, there's a town called Aurora about 30 miles from Washington up until 1852. It was known as Betty Town. Isaiah Hodge, a black man, a free black man, owned all 540 acres, and he named it after his wife, Betty. The land was taken by the seat in 1852, and then it was renamed Aurora. So we had overland routes where Freedom Seeker could go as well, but the river was the primary route. And from Washington's Pamlico Tar River, you could get on a ship and make your way to states in the north, and from the north, many went to Canada. Uh, From the port, you could travel south. A lot of people don't realize the Underground Railroad ran south. The original Underground Railroad in this country was Florida. 
So especially like places like Bradenton, Sarasota, St. Augustine. There was a town called Fort Mose um, community right out of St. Augustine. And so you could go there. From Florida, many people went to Mexico because Mexico had abolished slavery in 1829. And because of the Port of Washington and its prestige, by 1850, we were the largest shipbuilding port in North Carolina, and we were second only in size to Wilmington. So some of those ships leaving the port of North Carolina going across the Atlantic Ocean, if you could get on one of those ships, you literally could get your freedom anywhere. So what we do at the museum, we walk through the steps of how you would even be able to get on a ship. Underground Railroad communication, uh, the reason I'm dressed like this today, um, could convey information. A song, food, a nursery rhyme could convey information about how a freedom seeker could escape. So those are just some of the things that we share at the museum. We do a living history presentation to help our visitors understand how that communication was used. But we also line all of our information with documents. And so we have documents that go back as far as 1775. Uh, we were able to identify ships that were coming into the port of Bath, which would have included Washington. The port of Bath at that time was not the town of Bath, but it was a huge port that encompassed several, several counties. Um, Hyde County, Pamlico County, Craven County, Beaufort County. And so we are a part of the Africa to Carolina project, and we can ident identify ships that were bringing enslaved people here to Washington as early as 1754. So everything we share, we have the documents to prove it. Um, I grew up on 4th Street here in Washington. Elwood Plantation was on Main or 1st Street. The slave houses were on 2nd Street. So I grew up with a lot of stories that came from Elmwood Plantation, and we just provide the documents to go with those stories so that we can give authentic information about how freedom seekers were able to leave that plantation. In 2014, we were able, with the help of the Phoenix Historical Society, we were able to get the Port of Washington, which is a three mile um, stretch of the river, the Pamlico Tar River, designated it as a National Park Service underground network to freedom escape um, freedom site because we could prove to the National Park Service that that part of the river was used by freedom seekers to get their freedom. And so once we got the river designated and that designation is not only known in this country, it's known world, it's recognized worldwide. A lot of people started coming to Washington thinking we had a facility and we didn't. And so we asked the city of Washington, could we use that train to make a mini museum to talk about the Underground Railroad here in the greater Washington area? And it makes an excellent segue to talk about the Underground Railroad, which by the way, was not a train at all. Uh, which uh, I think as an early child, uh, my early memories of the Underground Railroad, that was obviously what my presumption was. Uh, we, we've reached the bottom of the hour, so we're going to take a, a commercial break here at this point. Uh, Ms. Jones, uh, when we come back, you mentioned your your attire. Now, we've got a radio audience, so I feel uh, com compelled to ask you when we come back to explain what your attire, what, what uh, uh, in your attire would have given signals or indications of your intent, I assume, to escape as a slave or to provide some some sort of message to uh, your fellow uh, people who were in who were engaged in this process of of freedom, and then obviously we can jump into so many other areas. I'm I'm just super excited about uh, this conversation. So we're going to take a break here. We're talking, to Mr. Mark Barnes. He's the spokesperson for the North Carolina History Center, and Miss uh, Lisa Jones, who among other things is a uh, it's Juneteenth Bureau Speaker and the co-founder of and executive director of the Washington Waterfront Underground Railroad Museum. So we'll be right back. I, I'm just, this is, you guys have so much information. It's just crazy. And I, I just remember when the, when the first idea of that history center came along and the vehement, the, 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 the black community here was just so opposed to it. 
and uh, having not grown up down here and valuing information that was accurate versus inaccurate, I, I just was at a loss to understand. Well, I, I shouldn't say I didn't understand it. I did understand the concern, but I thought that there were so many obvious ways to to address the concerns that it's going to turn into a lost cause conversation or a clan conversation. Right. So right. I, I, and the, the actual history, the actual history is so interesting because um, when Sherman came to town to destroy the arsenal, he had 25,000 escaped slaves with him. And nobody has told that story and hmm. nobody has told the story about Sherman directing his uh, officers to help those escaped slaves go down the Cape Fear River to Wilmington. And nobody has told about the upper class, the upper middle class community that they founded there with stores and churches and newspapers mm -hmm. and everything. And nobody has told the story about how white supremacists came in and destroyed that community in 1898. Um, and that, well, that that's story I have that me. story I have heard through Wilmington on Fire, the documentary. But you're right; it's not well known. It is not well known. The other thing that is so that's so striking to me, so striking to me, is that we have a son, and our son grew up here in Greens in West Greensboro, and near New Garden Friends Community. And I imagine Lisa Jones knows who New Garden Friends Community is, because we had here in this neighborhood. Um, we had an, a station of the Underground Railroad. Adrian Israel, who's a neighbor of mine, is a professor at Guilford College. She was one of the first Harry Jones speakers. And she talks about the Underground Railroad as it related here. Levi Coffin helped 3,000 slaves escape from here. And while I was telling you, know, I've, I've been talking the last couple of days with folks about it. My son went to Jefferson Elementary School within sight of, of the site of the Underground Railroad Station. Knew nothing about it. It was not taught. And to me, that was just tragic because there are uh, basically the farmers in this community would send their children out to feed the hogs. And they would feed them at night. And they would feed them plates of ham and sweet potatoes and everything else to the hogs. No, they weren't. They were leaving the plates on stumps, and the slaves would come out and eat. You know, they were providing a way for them to do that. They had uh, over in Jamestown, we have a Quaker uh, meeting over in Jamestown, which is not very far from Greensboro. And um, they have a wagon with a false bottom yes. that, they that they used to smuggle slaves from this area to Indiana, to another Quaker settlement. And from there, they would go to Canada. That was the, the preferred route from here. So the history that's not told. And history from university historians is part of it. Um, people from, you know, we have people from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill working with us, um, different, different schools, different museums, so forth. But greater than that, we've got families in 100 counties in North Carolina who have so far contributed their own family stories, you know, to what we've done, to what we have. And all of those stories are being collected, and all of those stories will be available. We have an interactive map of North Carolina we're going to be working on for the website. And you'll be able to clip on, click on, like you could say click on to Salisbury, and you would find the Confederate prison in Salisbury, and then you would find 8 or 10 or 12 or 14 family stories from Salisbury. So in the future, a kid from Salisbury could be sitting in his classroom and get an assignment to look up Salisbury on the, on the map, would find it and would see all these stories from the places where he walks and plays baseball and goes to school and goes to the food line every day. That we all have less than 60 seconds, by the way. All right, welcome back to the second half hour of Profiles and Perspectives with Darswell Rogers. I'm very pleased to have uh, with me, and we're all remote today, Mr. Mark Barnes. He's the public relations salesperson for the North Carolina History Center on the Civil War Emancipation and Reconstruction. And I also have Miss Lisa Jones. She is the co-founder and executive director of the Washington Waterfront Underground Railroad Museum in Washington, North Carolina. She's a well-known local historian in, East, in, in Eastern North Carolina. 
and she will be giving the Harry Jones Memorial Lecture on Monday, June 17th at Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church at 1217 Merchantson Road, which is directly across from Fayetteville State. And Ms. Jones, um, prior to the break, you were explaining how um, it, it that took as many as 15 people or as 15 people or more to help to have one enslaved person to to leave from eastern North Carolina. And you indicated that the attire that you're wearing is tied into these strategies. So if you could explain a little bit about what you're wearing for my radio listeners, I think that'd be helpful. And then how that all played out and then we can continue continue on. Well, Underground Railroad communication had to be something that looked entirely innocent. It, it had to look like an everyday item to be um, able to share the information. So not everybody knew what was going on. Um, we do know that Mr. Benjamin Lundy, a Quaker abolitionist, was here in Washington between the years of 1828 to 1832. And he was able to um, get information to freedom seekers on Elmwood Plantation about freedom seeking attempts. So those freedom seeking attempts had to secure the safety and freedom of the enslaved person, the freedom seeker, uh, the abolitionist, the person who is owning the ship. So the information had to be so covered up that you could look at something like why I'm dressed like this today and never even know what was going on. So part of the Underground Railroad communication we knew were songs, you know, Wade in the Water was one of the songs Harriet Tubman was said to use on the Kambachi River as a directive to stay near water. That way, if you hear dogs barking, uh, get in the water, it makes it harder for the dogs to pick up your scent. But Underground Railroad communication could also be clothing. Um, I represent Rebecca, who was an enslaved woman on plantation, on the Elmwood Plantation, who was a tanner. And she made um, clips for the drapery. She made things like uh, metal candlesticks. And Rebecca would take small pieces of metal. She pound them very flat, pierce a hole in it, and then attach it to a scarf that she wore. So this scarf represents uh, Rebecca's scarf. At the end of the scarf, which she attached with safety pins, uh, one of the kids in school said safety pins. We had to tell me, yeah, safety pins had been around a long time. Romans invented safety pins. So they would have been attached to her scarf with the metal pieces. She would also have a large pair of earrings, or they called them ear hangings at that time. And so when Rebecca walked by, she couldn't announce she was the freedom seeker who would need help escaping. Mr. Lundy would tell the abolitionists working with him, when Rebecca walks by, you are going to hear something. And so the, the ear hangings and the pieces of metal on the scarf are designed so when I walk by, you hear a clinking sound. Mm. That would direct the abolitionists to let them know that I am the freedom seeker who would be willing to try to go with them to escape. Um, some of the clothing I wear under the long undergarment, I'll tell you a little bit about that. It is a, we call them petticoats, but think thin skirts. Uh, one of the thin skirts had a gold braiding or yellow ribbon at the very hem of it. And so when that part of the garment was exposed to an abolitionist, it would mean I would need help by way of a stagecoach. Washington had two stagecoach line. And at that time, um, they would often go to Plymouth and New Bern, many times to pick up mail, but sometimes to pick up passengers. If I were to expose this part of my garment, then that would mean I would need help getting on a stagecoach, maybe going to Plymouth or Newburn to the port. Why would I want to go to Plymouth or Newburn? Because Washington would often be under surveillance. We had two slave markets that were right on the river, and people were in Washington all the time to buy enslaved people. And so if it was a lot of activity from uh, bounty hunters, the sheriffs, the patrollers, or people looking to buy enslaved people, um, I would probably try to need to get to maybe Newburn to try to leave on a ship from the port of Newburn. If I had this garment on, um, it's um, a petticoat, again, think thin skirt. 
Um, it's composed of the colors of light green, dark green, light tan, dark tan, and brown. It means I help need help over getting to an overland route. So it could be one of the communities I discussed earlier, like Aurora, or maybe some of the closer uh, communities like Keysville. Keysville is a community right uh, it's in Washington, about a mile from the Washington waterfront. It was called the Shadow of Egypt, and you could go there as a refuge. That land was owned by free, but by free blacks all um, in 1834. So maybe I'm trying to get to Keysville. And this garment, it's blue and white, and the blue and white has like a wavy pattern to it. It would simply mean that I needed help getting on a ship. So even the very clothing that I'm wearing was all constructed with the um, creative, creativity of the freedom seeker or the enslaved person to be able to communicate what kind of help they needed without using verbal words or gestures. Wow. So those are just some of the things that people will be able to see during the presentation um, at the Harry Jones um, uh, at Mount Sinai Church on the 17th. Wow, uh, amazing. There's, there's a couple of phrases that you've used that are not how I would communicate. So you you have consistently said enslaved people. My vernacular has always been slaves. I, I, I've taken that's a very conscious shifting in, in how it's being conveyed. Can you speak to that? Yes, enslaved the term enslaved gives the, the, the person dignity. Um, it gives them, um, it conveys the message that they were enslaved against their own will. So we've shifted the narrative from slaves to the enslaved to convey unto them the dignity that they truly deserve. Awesome, awesome. The, 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 one of the things that you've said about the various clothing suggests that, hey, I want to go this route versus this route versus this route, multiple scenarios. It really suggests a lot of a lot more strategy around what I'm doing versus just, hey, I'm just trying to get out of here, right? It's it's suggesting, and, and you've said several times, you've mentioned several times about, about locations that's that sounded like they were in the south but there were freed persons freed uh uh, uh, uh freed enslaved freed africans that yes. occupied these environments and so despite the confederacy our impression of it we don't really think very often about in the period of the confederacy that there were sleep uh, that there were freed blacks who in effect owned land and actually conducted business so if you can take both of those hopefully that would be great um we we try to help people to understand because sometimes when you have a brown skin people just assume somebody in your family was enslaved there were free blacks living here in Beaufort County in Washington, according to the documents, as early as 1755. So we do know that there were many free blacks here. There was a free black owning land in Blunt's Creek, North Carolina, as early as 1701. And so we try to help people to understand free blacks came here just like any other people group. Um, we try to help people to understand that because you have a brown skin or you're a person of color does not automatically mean that somebody in your family, you, you came from enslaved people. And that's another part of the narrative that we try to correct. Um, history is like a facet, uh, uh, the facets on a diamond. You, if you, the more you turn, the more you see. History is like a pancake on a plate. If you're looking at that pancake on the plate, you only see one side. You have to hold that pancake up to be able to see both sides. And what we try to do at the museum is to present the many sides of history that have not been well represented or very well documented. Um, the history books I read, um, we have 12 chapters on the Civil War. We'd have one paragraph on slavery and he usually read something like, Slaves worked in the fields, they sang all the time, and they were happy. 
Uh, no, no, no. Yep, and there was um, and there was a lady and there was a lady named Harriet Tubman that helped some of them get the freedom. Absolutely, absolutely. There were many um, enslaved people that sought to self-emancipate enslaved people. Yes, many of them worked in the fields, but many of them had highly skilled jobs. They were carpenters. They were shipbuilders. They were brick makers. They were mathematicians. They were scientists. They were physicians. And so, no, they did not all work in the field. If they were singing all the time, it was because 99% of the time, those songs were used to convey messages. And the part about they were happy, I find that debatable. Mm. But again, um, history is one of those things where there's an old African proverb that says, until the lion can talk, you will always hear the hunter's version of what happened. Until the lion writes the book, you will always read the book the hunter wrote. And so now the lion has to talk and the lion has to write the book to, to properly convey those parts of history that either conveniently or for some reason have been left out of the history books. And that's the history that we share at the museum. Mm, powerful. Let, let, let me note that uh, you've been listening to Ms. Lisa Jones, who's going to be the speaker uh, on June 17th at Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church as the Juneteenth speaker this, this year. This is being sponsored by the North Carolina History Center on the Civil War Emancipation and Reconstruction. And Mark, just to turn back to you, this is the sixth such uh, uh, opportunity that we've taken uh, for this. So if you can speak a little bit about the fact of, of uh, again, this is a, a really high quality opportunity for the entire community, and I mean the broad community, to learn things and just a sense that this is the sort of work that the History Center is is looking to promote and expand. Right, uh, thank you. The, the, we, we need to talk a little bit, I think, about Harry. And um, Harry was a force of nature. Harry, uh, Harry Jones uh, was the assistant director and curator of the African American Civil War Freedom Foundation and Museum in Washington. A bunch of the folks here or there in Fayetteville went to Washington to find out about museums. They wanted to learn about museums in what's probably, you know, the most museum rich city in the world. They went to the Smithsonian. They went to the Holocaust Museum. They went to different places. One of the places they went was to the African American Civil War Museum, and they heard Harry speak. And their jaws hit the floor. And they often did if you ever heard Harry Jones speak. I have. I've heard him a couple of times. Um, Harry came down to do a, a Juneteenth. We had done several Juneteenth uh, programs. Harry came down to do it from Washington to do a Juneteenth program at Fayetteville State in June of 2018. Um, there were, you know, all of us were there, the chancellor, all, you know, uh, the, the fundraiser, everybody, uh, the board was there to hear him speak. And again, he gave a powerful speech. They wrote about it in the newspapers and so forth. Several days after that, Harry died of a heart attack mm -hmm. in Washington. And we decided, you know, as a, you know, as a uh, center decided that what we were going to do to preserve his memory and his contribution to our understanding was to have the Harry Jones Memorial Lecture every year which we've tried to do. We missed a year because of COVID. Uh, but other than that, we've had um, uh, Dr. Adrian Israel uh, spoke along with Peter Murray, who is a Methodist college, famous professor of history at Clemson, Vernon Burton spoke, Spencer Crew, who I've mentioned before, who was the um, emeritus director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, Darren Waters, who is a deputy secretary of the state's Office of Archives and History and a well-known Western North Carolina historian. See, we, we, we go Western to Eastern to Central and so forth because this is going to be a, a center for the entire state. But it's important to us. It's important to us to bring people together to hear what the history is. And that's what we've, you know, without a building, that's what we've been doing. We've been doing that sort of thing. We've been doing, we've had, we have an educational director who goes around and does symposia, symposiums 
for school teachers and have done those in Asheville and Wilmington and Elizabeth City and, you know, and so forth, where we gather, um, we gather educators together in, in a hotel and then we send our, uh, our, our speaker in our, the, and he brings several history professors from that area uh, in to talk about the Civil War and how these teachers can better teach the Civil War to school children which is what, you know, our, basically our purpose is. Mm -hmm. We're doing that all before the building uh, has been completed. Um, we've, we've appeared in churches in, uh, in Raleigh. We've appeared in churches in, in Fayetteville, you know, and so forth. And that's one of the things that we will be doing on the 17th. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, uh, Mr. Jones, we, we've been talking to Mr. Mark Robinson. He's the public relations spokesperson for the North Carolina Barnes. History Center. I'm sorry, R Barnes. Barnes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mark, <laughs> Mr. Mark Barnes. How about that? A public relations spokesperson for the North Carolina History Center and Ms. Uh, Lisa Jones, uh, who was going to be the uh, speaker, um, the, the Harry Jones speaker at, for the Harry, excuse me, the Harry Jones speaker uh, on Monday, June 17th at Mount Sinai in commemoration for Juneteenth. I am uh, wanting Ms. Jones for folks to know, is there a website or whatever? You've got this amazing information and insight. You've talked a lot about the museum over in Washington, North Carolina, and you have to tell, a lot of folks may be like me and didn't know where Washington, North Carolina is. So if you could t tell us how we can get to the museum, uh, where where Washington, North Carolina is, that would be great. Well, Washington is um, 20 minutes away from Greenville. We always uh, recognize the largest major artery, which is Greenville. Um, East, the East Carolina University is there. So we are just a hop, skip, and a jump from Greenville. We are located on the, in the historic district on Main Street. You can learn a lot more about the Washington waterfront. We have several Facebook pages. Um, we have, um, if you Google, I love Google so much. If you Google Washington Waterfront Underground Railroad, you'll see a lot of clips where PBS and other um, organizations has filmed. And our parent company, the Washington Harbor District Alliance, you can um, go there and find a lot of information on their website as well. But we uh, try to encourage people to watch some of the clips um, so you can actually see what it is that we do and increase the understanding of what the Underground Railroad was, why it was important and why it's important today. We are happy to share that history with everyone. Amazing. Uh, this has been this has been gratifying. Uh, Mark, let me just finish. We've got about five minutes left. You have emphasized several times the fact that there's Eastern, Central, and Western history mm -hmm. in North Carolina, and that they're yes. that, that they're distinctly different. Can you give me a couple of minutes or examples on? So, if I'm in Western North Carolina, what was my experience during the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction versus, let's say, uh, what Mrs. Jones's uh, experience was or her ancestors were in on the eastern side of the state? In Western North Carolina basically it was unionists it was people who did not want to leave the union these were folks who were very opposed to secession both times that it came up for a vote in north carolina and when the war began they were increasingly people in west in the west who were joining the union army and fighting in the confederacy Oh, looks like he froze there. Um, that was some information. Oh, are you back? Okay, you, they, they were fighting it, and so you you froze for a minute. You said that the, that the, that the western a part of the state was more pro union, and then pick up from there. Right, the western part of the state was more pro union. They they opposed secession, uh, and they okay they opposed secession, and uh, they. Um, they really, when when the war began, they fought for the union. In the central part of the in the central part of the state, it was more of um, there were some there were some slaves, but it, there was a, a real emphasis in the Piedmont among the Quakers and others 
to uh, to help with um, emancipation. There was also a lot of peace rallies. There were people here who were urging North Carolina to get out of the Civil War and to um, to to end the fighting because they were seeing so many of their young men being killed for a cause that they didn't particularly agree with. Okay. In eastern North Carolina, it was plantations and slavery uh, because, you know, the waterways contributed to that, the transportation contributed to that, the soil and climate uh, being conducive to cotton and so forth contributed to that. Uh, but that was, that was basically it. This is the first time all of, our, all of our consultants are telling us this is the first time anyone has ever looked at the American Civil War from the lens of an entire state looking at the entirety of it and the only thing is and the experiences uh just in north carolina mirror the experiences of a lot of different places but all in one place this is a big state and there were uh there's a lot of history here there weren't very many battles but there was a lot of history here on the home front and that story was has never been told until now outstanding i i as a as a history person um, I have read the biographies of Ulysses S. Grant, um, which that that's reconstruct so much of his presidency was reconstruction and understanding his overall perception of of the enslaved people and the value that they brought and the the um, just the, the development the development of all the historically black colleges. I mean, there's there's so much that took place during the Reconstruction period that we don't fully understand. And obviously, North Carolina has been a tremendous beneficiary of uh, HBCUs and the like. But let, let me say, um, I, I greatly appreciate the the time, Mr. Mark Robinson, Public Relations Spokesperson for the North Carolina History Center. Barnes. 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 <laughs> what I'm is so it? sorry. I, 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 think, I, I think there's I think there's a candidate with that kind of a similar name. That, that, <laughs> there, 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 there is, and I and I'm and I'm I'm not in the endorsement business, so I my my apologies. <laughs> my, my 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 sincere apologies. Uh, Mark That's Barnes, right. public relations spokesperson for the North Carolina uh, yes. History Center. Miss Lisa Jones, who is going to be the uh, speaker on Monday the 17th at 7 p.m. at Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church. I really encourage everyone to come out for this June, Juneteenth Hari Jones Memorial Lecture Series. Thank both of you so much for having joined us this morning. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You Thank you. And for Thank my you. audience, and notwithstanding my, my, my snafus this morning, I hope you've enjoyed the program. <laughs> Uh, you're listening to Profiles and Perspectives with Darzwar Rogers. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.